Ilias, a short story by Leo Tolstoy. There once lived, in the government of Ufa, a Bashkir named Ilyas. His father, who died a year after he had found his son a wife, did not leave him much property. Ilyas then had only seven mares, two cows, and about a score of sheep. He was a good manager, however, and soon began to acquire more. He and his wife worked from morn till night, rising earlier than others and going later to bed, and his possessions increased year by year. Living in this way, Ilyas, little by little, acquired great wealth. At the end of thirty-five years, he had two hundred horses, one hundred and fifty head of cattle, and one thousand two hundred. Sheep. Hired labourers tended his flocks and herds, and hired women milked his mares and cows, and made kumis, butter, and cheese. Ilyas had abundance of everything, and everyone in the district envied him. They said of him, Ilyas is a fortunate man. He has plenty of everything. This world must be a pleasant place for him. People of position heard of Ilyas and sought his acquaintance. Visitors came to him from afar, and he welcomed everyone and gave them food and drink. Whoever might come, there was always kumis, tea, sherbet, and mutton to set before them. Whenever visitors arrived, a sheep would be killed, or sometimes two, and if many guests came, he would even slaughter a mare for them. Ilyas had three children, two sons and a daughter, and he married them all off. While he was poor, his sons worked with him and looked after the flocks and herds themselves, but when he grew rich, they got spoiled, and one of them took to drink. The eldest was killed in a brawl and the younger, who had married a self-willed woman, ceased to obey his father, and they could not live together any more. So they parted, and Ilyas gave his son a house and some of the cattle, and this diminished his wealth. Soon after that, a disease broke out among Ilyas's sheep, and many died. Then followed a bad harvest, and the hay crop failed, and many cattle died that winter. Then the Kyrgyz captured his best herd of horses, and Ilyas's property dwindled away. It became smaller and smaller, while at the same time his strength grew less, till, by the time he was seventy years old, he had begun to sell his furs, carpets, saddles and tents. At last he had to part with his remaining cattle and found himself face to face with want. Before he knew how it had happened, he had lost everything, and in their old age he and his wife had to go into service. Ilyas had nothing left except the clothes on his back, a fur cloak, a cup, his indoor shoes and overshoes, and his wife, Sham Shemagi, who also was old by this time. The son who had parted from him had gone into a far country, and his daughter was dead, so that there was no one to help the old couple. Their neighbour, Muhammad Shah, took pity on them. Muhammad Shah was neither rich nor poor, but lived comfortably and was a good man. He remembered Ilyas's hospitality, and pitying him, said, Come and live with me, Ilyas, you and your old woman. In summer you can work in my melon garden as much as your strength allows, and in winter feed my cattle, and Sham Shemagi shall milk my mares and make kumis. I will feed and clothe you both. When you need anything, tell me, and you shall have it. Ilyas thanked his neighbour and he and his wife took service with Muhammad Shah as labourers. At first the position seemed hard to them, but they got used to it and lived on, working as much as their strength allowed. Muhammad Shah found it was to his advantage to keep such people, because having been masters themselves, they knew how to manage and were not lazy, but did all the work they could. Yet it grieved Muhammad Shah to see people brought so low who had been of such high standing it happened once that some of Muhammad Shah's relatives came from a great distance to visit him, and a mullah came too. Muhammad Shah told Ilyas to catch a sheep and kill it. Ilyas skinned the sheep and boiled it, and then sent it into the guests. The guests ate the mutton, had some tea, and then began drinking kumis. As they were sitting with their host on down cushions on a carpet, conversing and sipping kumis from their cups, Ilyas, having finished his work, passed by the open door. 
Muhammad Shah, seeing him pass, said to one of the guests, Did you notice that old man who passed just now? Yes, said the visitor. What is there remarkable about him? Only this, that he was once the richest man among us, replied the host. His name is Ilyas. You may have heard of him. Of course I have heard of him, the guest answered. I never saw him before, but his fame has spread far and wide. Yes, and now he has nothing left, said Muhammad Shah, and he lives with me as my labourer, and his old woman is here too. She milks the mares. The guest was astonished. He clicked with his tongue, shook his head and said, Fortune turns like a wheel. One man it lifts, another it sets down. Does not the old man grieve over all he has lost? Who can tell? He lives quietly and peacefully and works well. May I speak to him? asked the guest. I should like to ask him about his life. Why not? replied the master, and he called from the kibitka in which they were sitting. Babai, which in the Bashkir tongue means grandfather. Come in and have a cup of kumis with us, and call your wife here also. Ilyas entered with his wife, and after exchanging greetings with his master and the guests, he repeated a prayer and seated himself near the door. His wife passed in behind the curtain and sat down with her mistress. A cup of kumis was handed to Ilyas. He wished the guests and his master good health, bowed, drank a little, and put down the cup. Well, Daddy, said the guest who had wished to speak to him, I suppose you feel rather sad at the sight of us. It must remind you of your former prosperity and of your present sorrows. Ilyas smiled and said, If I were to tell you what is happiness and what is misfortune, you would not believe me. You had better ask my wife. She is a woman, and what is in her heart is on her tongue. She will tell you the whole truth. The guest turned towards the curtain. Well, Granny, he cried, tell me how your former happiness compares with your present misfortune. And Sham Shamagi answered from behind the curtain. This is what I think about it. My old man and I lived for fifty years, seeking happiness and not finding it. And it is only now, these last two years, since we had nothing left and have lived as labourers, that we have found real happiness, and we wish for nothing better than our present lot. The guests were astonished, and so was the master. He even rose and drew the curtain back so as to see the old woman's face. There she stood with her arms folded, looking at her old husband, and smiling, and he smiled back at her. The old woman went on, I speak the truth, and do not jest. For half a century we sought for happiness, and as long as we were rich we never found it. Now that we have nothing left and have taken service as labourers, we have found such happiness that we want nothing better. But in what does your happiness consist? asked the guest. Why, in this, she replied. When we were rich, my husband and I had so many cares that we had no time to talk to one another, or to think of our souls, or to pray to God. Now we had visitors, and had to consider what food to set before them, and what presents to give them, lest they should speak ill of us. When they left, we had to look after our labourers, who were always trying to shirk work and get the best food, while we wanted to get all we could out of them. So we sinned. Then we were in fear, lest a wolf should kill a foal or a calf, or thieves steal our horses. We lay awake at night, worrying lest the ewes should overlie their lambs, and we got up again and again to see that all was well. One thing attended to, another care would spring up. How, for instance, to get enough fodder for the winter. And besides that, my old man and I used to disagree. He would say we must do so and so, and I would differ from him, and then we disputed, sinning again. So we passed from one trouble to another, from one sin to another, and found no happiness. Well, and now? Now, when my husband and I wake in the morning, we always have a loving word for one another, and we live peacefully, having nothing to quarrel about. We have no care but how best to serve our master. 
We work as much as our strength allows, and do it with a will that our master may not lose, but profit by us. When we come in, dinner or supper is ready, and there is kumis to drink. We have fuel to burn when it is cold, and we have our fur cloak. And we have time to talk, time to think of our souls, and time to pray. For fifty years we sought happiness, but only now at last have we found it. The guests laughed, but Ilyas said, Do not laugh, friends. It is not a matter for jesting. It is the truth of life. We also were foolish at first, and wept at the loss of our wealth. But now God has shown us the truth, and we tell it, not for our own consolation, but for your good. And the mullah said, That is a wise speech. Ilyas has spoken the exact truth. The same is said in Holy Writ. And the guests ceased laughing and became thoughtful. The Invaders, a volunteer's narrative, a short story by Leo Tolstoy. 1. On the 24th of July, Captain Klopov in epaulets and cap, a style of dress in which I had not seen him since my arrival in the Caucasus, entered the low door of my earth hut. I'm just from the colonels, he said in reply to my questioning look. Tomorrow, our battalion is to move. Where? I asked. To N. The troops have been ordered to muster at that place. And probably some expedition will be made from there, of course. In what direction, think you? I don't think. I tell you all I know. Last night a Tatar from the general came galloping up, brought orders for the battalion to march, taking two days' rations. But whither, why, how long, isn't for them to ask. Orders are to go. That's enough. Still, if they are going to take only two days' rations, it's likely the army will not stay longer. That's no argument at all. And how is that? I asked with astonishment. This is the way of it. When they went against Dargi, they took a week's rations, but they spent almost a month. And can I go with you? I asked, after a short silence. Yes, you can go. But my advice is, better not. Why run the risk? No, allow me to disregard your advice. I've been spending a whole month here for this very purpose, of having a chance to see action, and you want me to let it have the go-by. All right, come with us. Only isn't it true that it would be better for you to stay behind? You could wait for us here. You could go hunting. But as to us, God knows what will become of us. And that would be first rate he said, in such a convincing tone that it would seem to me at the first moment that it would actually be first-rate. Nevertheless, I said resolutely that I wouldn't stay behind for anything. And what have you to see there? said the captain, still trying to dissuade me. If you want to learn how battles are fought, read Mikhailovsky Danilevsky's Description of War, a charming book. There it's all admirably described, where every corps stands, and how battles are fought. On the contrary, that does not interest me, I replied. Well, now how is this? It simply means that you want to see how men kill each other, doesn't it? Here in 1832, there was a man like yourself, not in the regular service, a Spaniard, I think he was. He went on two expeditions with us, in a blue mantle or something of the sort, and so the young fellow was killed. Here, Batyushka, one is not surprised at anything. Ashamed as I was at the captain's manifest disapprobation of my project, I did not attempt to argue him down. Well, he was brave, wasn't he? God knows as to that. He always used to ride at the front. Wherever there was firing, there he was. So he must have been brave then, said I. No, that doesn't signify bravery. His putting himself where he wasn't called. What do you call bravery, then? Bravery, bravery, repeated the captain, with the expression of a man to whom such a question presents itself for the first time. A brave man is one who conducts himself as he ought, said he, after a brief consideration. I remembered that Plato defined bravery as the knowledge of what one ought, and what one ought not to fear, 
and in spite of the triteness and obscurity in the terminology of the captain's definition, I thought that the fundamental conception of both was not so unlike as might at first sight appear, and that the captain's definition was even more correct than the Greek philosopher's, for the reason that, if he could have expressed himself as Plato did, he would in all probability have said that that man is brave who fears only what he ought to fear, and not what there is no need of fearing. I was anxious to explain my thought to the captain. Yes, I said, it seems to me that in every peril there is an alternative, and the alternative adopted under the influence of, say, the sentiment of duty, is bravery, but the alternative adopted under the influence of a lower sentiment is cowardice. Therefore, it is impossible to call a man brave who risks his life out of vanity or curiosity or greediness, and, vice versa, the man who under the influence of the virtuous sentiment of family obligation or simply from conviction avoids peril cannot be called a coward. The captain looked at me with a queer sort of expression while I was talking. Well, now, I don't know how to reason this out with you, said he, filling his pipe but we have with us a junker, and he likes to philosophize. You talk with him. He also writes poetry. I had only become intimate with the captain in the Caucasus, but I had known him before in Russia. His mother, Maria Ivanovna Klopova, the owner of a small landed estate, lives about two versts from my home. Before I went to the Caucasus, I visited her. The old lady was greatly delighted that I was going to see her Pashinka, Thus she called the old grey-haired captain, and, like a living letter, could tell him about her circumstances and give him a little message. Having made me eat my fill of a glorious pie and roast chicken, Maria Ivanovna went to her sleeping room and came back with a rather large black relic bag, to which was attached some kind of silken ribbon. Here is this image of our mother intercessor from the September festival, she said kissing the picture of the Divine Mother attached to the cross and putting it into my hand. Please give it to him, Batyushka. You see, when he went to the Kaikas, I had a Te Deum sung and made a vow that if he should be safe and sound, I would order this image of the Divine Mother. And here it is, seventeen years that the Matushka and the saints have had him in their keeping. Not once has he been wounded, and what battles he has been in, as it seems. When Mikhailo, who was with him, told me about it, my hair actually stood on end. You see, all that I know about him I have to hear from others. He never writes me anything about his doings, my dove. He is afraid of frightening me. I had already heard in the Caucasus, but not from the captain himself, that he had been severely wounded four times, and, as was to be expected, he had not written his mother about his wounds any more than about his campaigns. Now let him wear this holy image, she continued. I bless him with it. The most holy intercessor protect him, especially in battle, may she always look after him. And so tell him, my dear friend, that thy mother gave thee this message. I promised faithfully to fulfil her commission. I know you will be fond of him, of my Pashinka, the old lady continued. He is such a splendid fellow. Would you believe me? Not a year goes by without his sending me money, and he also helps Anushka, my daughter, and all from his wages alone. Truly I shall always thank God, she concluded with tears in her eyes, that he has given me such a child. Does he write you often? I asked. Rarely, Batyushka. Not more than once a year, and sometimes when he sends money he writes a little word and sometimes he doesn't. If I don't write you, Mamenka, he says, it means that I'm alive and well, but if anything should happen, which God forbid, then they will write you for me. When I gave the captain his mother's gift, it was in my room, he asked me for some wrapping paper, carefully tied it up and put it away. I gave him many details of his mother's life. The captain was silent. When I had finished, he went into a corner and took a very long time in filling his pipe. Yes, she's a fine old lady, said he from the corner in a rather choked voice. God grant that we may meet again. Great love and grief were expressed in these simple words. Why do you serve here? I asked. Have to serve, he replied with decision. 
and double pay means a good deal for our brother, who is a poor man. The captain lived economically. He did not play cards, he rarely drank to excess, and he smoked ordinary tobacco, which from some inexplicable reason he did not call by its usual name, but Sambro Talicheski Tabak. The captain had pleased me even before this. He had one of those simple, calm Russian faces, and looked you straight in the eye agreeably and easily. But after this conversation, I felt a genuine respect for him. Two. At four o'clock on the morning of the next day, the captain came riding up to my door. He had on an old, well-worn coat without epaulets, wide lesbian trousers, a round white Circassian cap with drooping lambskin dyed yellow and an ugly-looking Asiatic sabre across his shoulder. The little white horse on which he rode came with head down and mincing gait and kept switching his slender tail. In spite of the fact that the good captain's figure was neither very warlike nor very handsome, yet there was in it such an expression of goodwill toward everyone around him that it inspired involuntary respect. I did not keep him waiting a minute, but immediately mounted, and we rode off together from the gate of the fortress. The battalion was already two hundred thousands ahead of us, and had the appearance of some black, solid body in motion. It was possible to make out that it was infantry, only from the circumstance that while the bayonets appeared like long, dense needles, occasionally there came to the ear the sounds of a soldier's song, the drum, and a charming tenor, the leader of the sixth company, a song which I had more than once enjoyed at the fort. The road ran through the midst of a deep, wide ravine, or balka, as it is called in the Caucasian dialect, along the banks of a small river, which at this time was playing, that is, was having a freshet. Flocks of wild pigeons hovered around it, now settling on the rocky shore, now wheeling about in mid-air in swift circles and disappearing from sight. The sun was not yet visible, but the summit of the bulka on the right began to grow luminous. The grey and white-coloured crags, the greenish-yellow moss wet with dew, the clumps of different kinds of wild thorn stood out extraordinarily distinct and rotund in the pellucid golden light of the sunrise. On the other hand, the ravine, hidden in thick mist which rolled up like smoke in varying volumes, was damp and dark and gave the impression of an indistinguishable mixture of colours, pale lilac, almost purple, dark green and white. Directly in front of us, Against the dark blue of the horizon, with startling distinctness, appeared the dazzling white, silent masses of the snow-capped mountains with their marvellous shadows and outlines exquisite, even in the smallest details. Crickets, grasshoppers, and a thousand other insects were awake in the tall grass and filled the air with their sharp, incessant clatter. It seemed as though a numberless multitude of tiny bells were jingling in our very ears. The atmosphere was alive with waters, with foliage, with mist, in a word, had all the life of a beautiful early summer morning. The captain struck a light and began to puff at his pipe. The fragrance of Sambro Talicheski tabak and of the punk struck me as extremely pleasant. We rode along the side of the road so as to overtake the infantry as quickly as possible. The captain seemed more serious than usual. He did not take his Dagestan pipe from his mouth, and at every step he dug his heels into his horse's legs as the little beast, capering from one side to the other, laid out a scarcely noticeable dark green track through the damp, tall grass. Up from under his very feet, with its shrill cry, and that drumming of the wings that is so sure to startle the huntsman in spite of himself, flew the pheasant and slowly winged its flight on high. The captain paid him not the slightest attention. We had almost overtaken the battalion when behind us was heard the sound of a galloping horse, and in an instant there rode by us a very handsome young fellow in an officer's coat and a tall white Circassian cap. As he caught up with us, he smiled, bowed to the captain, and waved his whip. I only had time to notice that he sat in the saddle and held the bridle with peculiar grace, and that he had beautiful dark eyes, a finely cut nose, and a moustache just beginning to grow. I was particularly attracted by the way in which he could not help smiling 
as if to impress it upon us that we were friends of his. If by nothing else than his smile, one would have known that he was still very young. And now, where is he going? grumbled the captain with a look of dissatisfaction, not taking his pipe from his mouth. Who is that? I asked. Ensign Alanin, a subaltern officer of my company. Only last month he came from the School of Cadets. This is the first time that he's going into action, I suppose, said I. And so he is overjoyed, replied the captain thoughtfully, shaking his head. It's youth. And why shouldn't he be glad? I can see that for a young officer this must be very interesting. The captain said nothing for two minutes. And that's why I say it's youth he continued in a deep tone. What is there to rejoice in when there's nothing to see? Here, when one goes often, one doesn't find any pleasure in it. Here, let us suppose there are twenty of us officers going. Some of us will be either killed or wounded. That's likely. Today, my turn, tomorrow his, the next day, somebody else's. So what is there to rejoice in? 3. Scarcely had the bright sun risen above the mountains and begun to shine into the valley where we were riding when the undulating clouds of mist scattered and it grew warm. The soldiers with guns and knapsacks on their backs marched slowly along the dusty road. In the ranks were frequently heard mallow russian dialogues and laughter. A few old soldiers in white linen coats, for the most part non-commissioned officers, marched along the roadside with their pipes, engaged in earnest conversation. The triple rows of heavily laden wagons advanced step by step and raised a thick dust which hung motionless. The mounted officers rode in advance, a few jiggeted, as they say in the Caucasus, that is, applying the whip to their horses, they spurred them on to make four or five leaps and then reined them in suddenly, pulling the head back. Others listened to the song singers, who, notwithstanding the heat and the oppressive air, indefatigably tuned up one song after another. A hundred sergeants in advance of the infantry, on a great white horse, surrounded by mounted Tatars, rode a tall, handsome officer in Asiatic costume, known to the regiment as a man of reckless valour, one who cuts anyone straight in the eyes. He wore a black Tatar half coat or beshmet, trimmed with silver braid. Similar trousers, new leggings closely laced with chirazui as they call galloons in the Caucasus, and a tall yellow Circassian cap worn jauntily on the back of his head. On his breast and back were silver lacings. His powder flask and pistol were hung at his back. Another pistol and a dagger in a silver sheath depended from his belt. Besides all this was buckled on a sabre in a red Morocco sheath adorned with silver, and over the shoulder hung his musket in a black case. By his garb, his carriage, his manner, and indeed by every motion, it was manifest that his ambition was to ape the Tatars. He was just saying something, in a language that I did not understand, to the Tatars who rode with him. But from the doubtful, mocking glances which these latter gave each other, I came to the conclusion that they did not understand him either. This was one of our young officers of the daredevil, Jigit order, who get themselves up a la Marlinsky and Lermontov. These men look upon the Caucasus, as it were, through the prism of the heroes of our time, Mullah Nurov and others, and in all their activities are I directed not by their own inclinations, but by the example of these models. This lieutenant, for instance, was very likely fond of the society of well-bred women and men of importance, generals, colonels, adjutants. I may even go so far as to believe that he was very fond of this society because he was in the highest degree vainglorious, but he considered it his unfailing duty to show his rough side to all important people, although he offended them always more or less. And when any lady made her appearance at the fortress, then he considered it his duty to ride by her windows with his cronies, or kunaki as they are called in the dialect of the Caucasus, dressed in a red shirt and nothing but chuviaki on his bare legs, and shouting and swearing at the top of his voice, but all this not only with the desire to insult her, but also to show her what handsome white legs he had, and how easy it would be to fall in love with him if only he himself were willing.
or he often went by at night with two or three friendly Tatars to the mountains into ambush by the road so as to take by surprise and kill hostile Tatars coming along. And though more than once his heart told him that there was nothing brave in such a deed, yet he felt himself under obligations to inflict suffering upon people in whom he thought that he was disappointed and whom he affected to hate and despise. He always carried two things, an immense holy image around his neck and a dagger above his shirt. He never took them off, but even went to bed with them. He firmly believed that enemies surrounded him. It was his greatest delight to argue that he was under obligations to wreak vengeance on someone and wash out insults in blood. He was persuaded that spite, vengeance and hatred of the human race were the highest and most poetical of feelings. But his mistress, a Circassian girl course, whom I happened afterwards to meet, said that he was the mildest and gentlest of men, and that every evening he wrote in his gloomy diary, cast up his accounts on ruled paper, and got on his knees to say his prayers, and how much suffering he endured to seem to himself only what he desired to be, because his comrades and the soldiers could not comprehend him as he desired. Once, in one of his nocturnal expeditions with his Tatar friends, it happened that he put a bullet into the leg of a hostile Chechenitz and took him prisoner. This Chechenitz for seven weeks thereafter lived with the lieutenant. The lieutenant dressed his wound, waited on him as though he were his nearest friend, and when he was cured, sent him home with gifts. Afterwards, during an expedition when the lieutenant was retreating from the post, having been repulsed by the enemy, he heard someone call him by name and his wounded kunak strode out from among the hostile Tatars and by signs asked him to do the same. The lieutenant went to meet his kunak and shook hands with him. The mountaineers stood at some little distance and refrained from firing, but as soon as the lieutenant turned his horse to go back, several shot at him, and one bullet grazed the small of his back. Another time I myself saw a fire break out by night in the fortress, and two companies of soldiers were detailed to put it out. Amid the crowd, lighted up by the ruddy glare of the fire, suddenly appeared the tall form of the man on a coal-black horse. He forced his way through the crowd and rode straight to the fire. As soon as he came near, the lieutenant leaped from his horse and hastened into the house, which was all in flames on one side. At the end of five minutes he emerged with singed hair and burned sleeves, carrying in his arms two doves which he had rescued from the flames. His name was Rosencrantz, but he often spoke of his ancestry, traced it back to the Varangians, and clearly showed that he and his forefathers were genuine Russians. 4. The sun had travelled half its course and was pouring down through the glowing atmosphere its fierce rays upon the parched earth. The dark blue sky was absolutely clear, only the bases of the snow-capped mountains began to clothe themselves in pale, lilac clouds. The motionless atmosphere seemed to be full of some impalpable dust. It became intolerably hot. When the army came to a small brook that had overflowed half the road, a halt was called. The soldiers, stacking their arms, plunged into the stream. The commander of the battalion sat down in the shade, on a drum, and showing by his broad countenance the degree of his rank, made ready, in company with a few officers, to take lunch. The captain lay on the grass under the company's transport wagon, the gallant Lieutenant Rosencrans and some other young officers, spreading out their Caucasian mantles or burkey, threw themselves down and began to carouse as was manifest by the flasks and bottles scattered around them, and by the extraordinary liveliness of their singers, who, standing in a half-circle behind them, gave an accompaniment to the Caucasian dance-song sung by a lesbian girl. Shamil resolved to make a league. In the years gone by, Trai Rai, Ratat Tai, in the years gone by. Among these officers was also the young ensign who had passed us in the morning. He was very entertaining. His eyes gleamed, his tongue never grew weary. He wanted to greet everyone and show his goodwill to them all. Poor lad. He did not know that in acting this way he might be ridiculous, that his frankness and the gentleness which he showed to everyone might win for him, not the love which he so much desired, but ridicule. 
He did not know this either, that when at last, thoroughly heated, he threw himself down on his burka and leaned his head on his hand, letting his thick black curls fall over, he was a very picture of beauty. Two officers crouched under a wagon and were playing cards on a hamper. I listened with curiosity to the talk of the soldiers and officers and attentively watched the expression of their faces. But to tell the truth, in not one could I discover a shadow of that anxiety which I myself felt. Jokes, laughter, anecdotes expressed the universal carelessness and indifference to the coming peril. How impossible to suppose that it was not fated for some never again to pass that road. 5. At seven o'clock in the evening, dusty and weary, we entered the wide, fortified gate of Fort N. The sun was setting and shed a bleak rosy rays over the picturesque batteries and lofty walled gardens that surrounded the fortress, over the fields yellow for the harvest, and over the white clouds which, gathering around the snow-capped mountains, simulated their shapes and formed a chain no less wonderful and beauteous. A young half-moon, like a translucent cloud, shone above the horizon. In the native village, or Aul, situated near the gate, a Tatar on the roof of a hut was calling the faithful to prayer. The singers broke out with new zeal and energy. After resting and making my toilet, I set out to call upon an adjutant who was an acquaintance of mine, to ask him to make my intention known to the general. On the way from the suburb where I was quartered, I chanced to see a most unexpected spectacle in the fortress of N. I was overtaken by a handsome two-seated vehicle in which I saw a stylish bonnet and heard French spoken. From the open window of the commandant's house came floating the sounds of some lizanka or katenka. Polka played upon a wretched piano out of tune. In the tavern which I was passing were sitting a number of clerks over their glasses of wine with cigarettes in their hands, and I overheard one saying to another, Excuse me, but taking politics into consideration, Maria Grigorievna is our first lady. A humpbacked Jew of sickly countenance, dressed in a dilapidated coat, was creeping along with a shrill, broken-down hand organ, and over the whole suburb echoed the sounds of the finale of Lucia. Two women in rustling dresses with silk kerchiefs around their necks and bright-coloured sunshades in their hands hastened past me on the plank sidewalk. Two girls, one in pink, the other in a blue dress with uncovered heads, were standing on the terrace of a small house and affectedly laughing with the obvious intention of attracting the notice of some passing officers. Officers in new coats, white gloves and glistening epaulets were parading up and down the streets and boulevards. I found my acquaintance on the lower floor of the general's house. I had scarcely had time to explain to him my desire and have his assurance that it could most likely be gratified when the handsome carriage which I had before seen, rattled past the window where I was sitting. From the carriage descended a tall, slender man, in uniform of the infantry service and major's epaulets, and came up to the general's rooms. Ah, pardon me, I beg of you, said the adjutant, rising from his place. It's absolutely necessary that I tell the general. Who is it that just came? I asked. The countess, he replied and donning his uniform coat hastened upstairs. In the course of a few minutes there appeared on the steps a short but very handsome man in a coat without epaulets and a white cross in his buttonhole. Behind him came the major, the adjutant, and two other officers. In his carriage, his voice in all his motions, the general showed that he had a very keen appreciation of his high importance. Bonsoir, Madame la Comtesse, he said extending his hand through the carriage window. A dainty little hand in dogskin glove took his hand, and a pretty, smiling little visage under a yellow bonnet appeared in the window. From the conversation which lasted several minutes, I only heard, as I went by, the general saying in French with a smile, You know that I have vowed to fight the infidels. Beware of becoming one. A laugh rang from the carriage. Adieu donc, cher général. Non, au revoir, said the general, returning to the steps of the staircase. 
Don't forget that I have invited myself for tomorrow evening. The carriage drove away. Here is a man, said I to myself as I went home, who has everything that Russians strive after, rank, wealth, society, and this man, before a battle the outcome of which God only knows, jests with a pretty little woman and promises to drink tea with her on the next day, just as though he had met her at a ball. There, at that adjutant's, I became acquainted with a man who still more surprised me. It was the young lieutenant of the K Regiment who was distinguished for his almost feminine mildness and cowardice. He came to the adjutant to pour out his peevishness and ill-humour against those men who, he thought, were intriguing against him to keep him from taking part in the matter in hand. He declared that it was hateful to be treated so, that it was not doing as comrades ought, that he would remember him, and so forth. As soon as I saw the expression of his face, as soon as I heard the sound of his voice, I could not escape the conviction that he was not only not putting it on, but was deeply stirred and hurt, because he was not allowed to go against the Cherkas and expose himself to their fire. He was as much hurt as a child is hurt who is unjustly punished. I could not understand it at all. 6. At ten o'clock in the evening the troops were ordered to march. At half-past nine I mounted my horse and started off to find the general, but on reflecting that he and his adjutant must be busy, I remained in the street and tying my horse to a fence, sat down on the terrace to wait until the general should come. The heat and glare of the day had already vanished in the fresh night air, and the obscure light of the young moon, which, enfolding around itself a pale, gleaming halo against the dark blue of the starry sky, was beginning to decline. Lights shone in the windows of the houses and in the chinks of the earth huts, the gracefully proportioned poplars in the gardens, standing out against the horizon from behind the earth huts, whose reed-thatched roofs gleamed pale in the moonlight, seemed still taller and blacker. The long shadows of the houses, of the trees, of the fences, lay beautifully across the white, dusty road. In the river rang incessantly the voice of the frogs, in the streets were heard hurrying steps and sounds of voices and the galloping of horses. From the suburb came floating, now and again, the strains of the hand organ, now the popular Russian air. The winds are blowing, now one of the aurora waltzes. I will not tell what my thoughts were, in the first place, because I should be ashamed to confess to the melancholy ideas which without cessation arose in my mind, while all around me I perceived only gaiety and mirth, and in the second place, because they have nothing to do with my story. I was so deeply engrossed in thought that I did not notice that the bell was ringing for eleven o'clock, and the general was riding past me with his suite. The rear guard was just at the fortress gate. I galloped at full speed across the bridge, amid a crush of cannon, caissons, military wagons, and commanding officers shouting at the top of their voices. After reaching the gate, I rode at a brisk trot for almost a verst, past the army stretched out and silently moving through the darkness, and overtook the general. As I made my way past the mounted artillery dragging their ordnance, amid the cannon and officers, a German voice like a disagreeable dissonance interrupting soft and majestic harmony, struck my ear. It screamed, Acting kissed, bring a linstock! And a soldier's voice replied, quick as a flash, Chevchenko, the lieutenant, asks for a light. The greater part of the sky had become enveloped in long steel-grey clouds. Here and there gleamed from between them the lustreless stars. The moon was now sinking behind the near horizon of dark mountains which were on the right, and it shed on their summits a feeble, waning half-light, which contrasted sharply with the impenetrable darkness that marked their bases. The air was mild and so still that not a single grass blade, not a single mist wreath moved. It became so dark that it was impossible to distinguish objects, even though very near at hand. On the side of the road there seemed to me sometimes to be rocks, sometimes animals, sometimes strange men, and I knew that they were bushes only when I heard them rustle and felt the coolness of the dew with which they were covered. 
In front of me, I saw a dense, waving black shadow, behind which followed a few moving spots. This was the vanguard of cavalry and the general with his suite. Between us moved another similar black mass, but this was not as high as the first. This was the infantry. Such silence reigned in the whole detachment that there could be plainly distinguished all the harmonious voices of the night, full of mysterious charm. The distant melancholy howls of jackals, sometimes like the wails of despair, sometimes like laughter, the monotonous ringing song of the cricket, the frog, the quail, a gradually approaching murmur, the cause of which I could not make clear to my own mind, and all those nocturnal, almost audible motions of nature, which it is so impossible either to comprehend or define, unite into one complete, beautiful harmony, which we call silent night. This silence was broken, or rather was unified, by the dull thud of the hooves and the rustling of the tall grass through which the division was slowly moving. Occasionally, however, was heard in the ranks the ring of a heavy cannon, the sound of clashing bayonets, stifled conversation, and the snorting of a horse. Nature breathed peacefully in beauty and power. Is it possible that people find no room to live together in this beautiful world, under this boundless starry heaven? Is it possible that amid this bewitching nature the soul of man can harbour the sentiments of hatred and revenge or the passion for inflicting destruction upon his kind? All ugly feelings in the heart of man ought, it would seem, to vanish away in this intercourse with nature, with this immediate expression of beauty and goodness. 7. We had now been marching more than two hours. I began to feel chilly and to be overcome with drowsiness. In the darkness the same indistinct objects dimly appeared. At a little distance, the same black shadow, the same moving spot. Beside me was the crupper of a white horse, which switched his tail and swung his hind legs in wide curves. I could see a back in a white Circassian shirt, against which was outlined a carbine in its black case, and the handle of a pistol in an embroidered holster the glow of a cigarette casting a gleam on a reddish moustache, a fur collar, and a hand in a chamois skin glove. I leaned over my horse's neck, closed my eyes, and lost myself for a few minutes. Then suddenly the regular hoofbeat and rustling came into my consciousness again. I looked around, and it seemed to me as though I were standing still in one spot, and that the black shadow in front of me was moving down upon me, or else that the shadow stood still, and I was rapidly riding down upon it. At one such moment I was more strongly than ever impressed by that incessantly approaching sound, the cause of which I could not fathom. It was the roar of water. We were passing, though, a deep gulch, and coming close to a mountain river, which at that season was in full flood. The roaring became louder, the damp grass grew taller and thicker, Bushes were encountered in denser clumps, and the horizon narrowed itself down to closer limits. Now and then, in different places in the dark hollows of the mountains, bright fires flashed out and were immediately extinguished. Tell me, please, what are those fires? I asked in a whisper of the Tatar riding at my side. Don't you really know? was his reply. No, said I. That is mountain straw tied to a pole and the light is waved. What for? So that every man may know the Russian is coming. Now in the Alls, he added with a smile. I, I, the Tomasha, are flying about. Every sort of Kurdamurda will be hurried into the ravines. How do they know so soon in the mountains that the expedition is coming? I asked. I, how can they help knowing? It's known everywhere. That's the kind of people we are. And so Shamil is now getting ready to march out? I asked. Yok? No, he replied, shaking his head as a sign of negation. Shamil will not march out. Shamil will send his naibs, and he himself will look down from up yonder through his glass. But doesn't he live a long way off? Not a long way off. Here at your left, about ten versts he will be. How do you know that? I inquired. Have you been there? I've been there. All of us in the mountains have. And you have seen Shamil? Pich, Shamil is not to be seen by us. 
A hundred, three hundred, a thousand murids surround him. Shamal will be in the midst of them, he said, with an expression of fawning civility. Looking up in the air, it was possible to make out that the sky which had become clear again was lighter in the east, and the Pleiades were sinking down into the horizon. But in the gulch through which we were passing, it was humid and dark. Suddenly, a little in advance of us, from out the darkness flashed a number of lights. At the same instant, with a ping, some bullets whizzed by, and from out the silence that surrounded us from afar arose the heavy, overmastering roar of the guns. This was the vanguard of the enemy's pickets. The Tatars, of which it was composed, set up their war cry, shot at random, and fled in all directions. Everything became silent again. The general summoned his interpreter. The Tatar in a white Circassian dress hastened up to him, and the two held a rather long conversation in a sort of whisper and with many gestures. Colonel Kasanov, give orders to scatter the enemy, said the general in a low, deliberate, but distinct tone of voice. The division went down to the river. The Black Mountains stood back from the pass. It was beginning to grow light. The arch of heaven, in which the pale, lustreless stars were barely visible, seemed to come closer. The dawn began to glow brightly in the east. A cool, penetrating breeze sprang up from the west, and a bright mist-like steam arose from the foaming river. 8. The guide pointed out the ford, and the vanguard of cavalry, with the general and his suite immediately in its rear, began to cross the river. The water, which reached the horses' breasts, rushed with extraordinary violence among the white boulders, which in some places came to the top, and formed foaming, gurgling whirlpools around the horses' legs. The horses were frightened at the roar of the water, lifted their heads, pricked up their ears, but slowly and carefully picked their way against the stream along the uneven bottom. The riders held up their legs and firearms. The foot soldiers, literally in their shirts alone, lifting above the water their muskets to which were fastened their bundles of clothing, struggled against the force of the stream by clinging together, a score of men at a time, showing noticeable determination on their excited faces. The artillerymen on horseback, with a loud shout, put their horses into the water at full trot. The cannon and green-painted caissons, over which now and then the water came pouring, plunged with a clang over the rocky bottom. But the noble Cossack horses pulled with united effort, made the water foam, and with dripping tails and manes emerged on the farther shore. As soon as the crossing was effected, the general's face suddenly took on an expression of deliberation and seriousness. He wheeled his horse around, and at full gallop rode across the wide, forest-surrounded field which spread before us. The Cossack horses were scattered along the edge of the forest. In the forest appeals a man in Circassian dress and round cap, then a second and a third. One of the officers shouts, Those are Tatars. At this instant, a puff of smoke came from behind a tree, a report, another. The quick volleys of our men drown out those of the enemy. Only occasionally a bullet with long-drawn ping like the hum of a bee flies by and is the only proof that not all the shots are ours. Here the infantry at double quick and with fixed bayonets dash against the chain. One can hear the heavy reports of the guns, the metallic clash of grape shot, the whiz of rockets, the crackling of musketry, the cavalry, the infantry converge from all sides on the wide field. The smoke from the guns, rockets and firearms unites with the early mist arising from the dew-covered grass. Colonel Kasanov gallops up to the general and reins in his horse while at full tilt. Your Excellency, says he, lifting his hand to his cap, give orders for the cavalry to advance. The standards are coming, and he points with his whip to mounted Tatars, at the head of whom rode two men on white horses with red and blue streamers on their lances. All right, Ivan Mikhailovich, says the general. The colonel wheels his horse round on the spot, draws his sabre and shouts, Hurrah! 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 echoes from the ranks, and the cavalry dash after him. All look on with excitement. There is a standard, another, a third, 
a fourth. The enemy, not waiting the assault, fly into the forest and open a musket fire from behind the trees. The bullets fly more and more thickly. Quel charmant coup d'oeil, exclaimed the general, as he easily rose in English fashion on his coal-black, slender-limbed little steed. Charmant, replies the major, who rolls his R's like a Frenchman and whipping up his horse dashes after the general. It's a genuine pleasure to carry on war in such a fine country, says he. And above all in good company, adds the general still in French, with a pleasant smile. The major bowed. At this time a cannonball from the enemy comes flying by with a swift, disagreeable whiz and strikes something. Immediately is heard the groan of a wounded man. This groan impresses me so painfully that the martial picture instantly loses for me all its fascination. But no one beside myself seems to be affected in the same way. The major smiles apparently with the greatest satisfaction. Another officer with perfect equanimity repeats the opening words of a speech. The general looks in the opposite direction and with the most tranquil smile says something in French. Will you give orders to reply to their heavy guns? asks the commander of the artillery, galloping up. Yes, scare them a little, says the general carelessly, lighting a cigar. The battery is unlimbered and the cannonade begins. The ground shakes under the report, the firing continues without cessation, and the smoke in which it is scarcely possible to distinguish those attending the guns blinds the eyes. The our wall is battered down, Again, Colonel Kasanov dashes up and at the general's command darts off to the owl. The war cry is heard again and the cavalry disappears in the cloud of its own dust. The spectacle was truly grandiose. One thing only spoiled the general impression for me as a man who had no part in the affair and was wholly unwonted to it. And this was that there was too much of it, the motion and the animation and the shouts. Involuntarily, the comparison occurred to me of a man who in his haste would cut the air with a hatchet. 9. The owl was already in the possession of our men, and not a soul of the enemy remained in it when the general with his suite, to which I had joined myself, entered it. The long neat huts or sackly, with their flat earthen roofs and red chimneys, were situated on rough, rocky hills, between which ran a small river. On one side were seen the green gardens, shining in the clear sunlight, with monstrous pear trees and the plum trees, called Luicha. The other side bristled with strange shadows, where stood the high perpendicular stones of a cemetery, and the tall wooden poles adorned at the ends with balls and variegated banners. These were the tombs of Jiggets. The army stood drawn up within the gates. After a moment, the dragoons, the Cossacks, the infantry, with evident joy, were let loose through the crooked streets, and the empty owl suddenly teemed with life. Here a roof is crushed in, the axe rings on the tough trees, and the plank door is broken down. Their hayricks, fences, and huts are burning, and the dense smoke arises like a tower in the clear air. Here a Cossack is carrying off sacks of flour and carpets, a soldier with a gay face lugs from a hut a tin basin and a dish clout. Another with outstretched arms is trying to catch a couple of hens, which cackling furiously fly about the yard. A third is going somewhere with a monstrous cumgan or pitcher of milk and drinking as he goes, and when he has had his fill, smashes it on the ground with a loud laugh. The battalion which I had accompanied from Fort N was also in the owl. The captain was sitting on the roof of a hut and was puffing from his short little pipe clouds of smoke of San Brutalicheski tabac with such an indifferent expression of countenance that when I saw him I forgot that I was in a hostile owl and it seemed to me that I was actually at home with him. Ah, and here you are, he said as he caught sight of me. The tall form of Lieutenant Rosencrantz flashed here and there through the oll. Without a moment's pause, he was engaged in carrying out orders, and he had the appearance of a man who had all he could do. I saw him coming out of a hut, his face full of triumph. Behind him, two soldiers were dragging an old Tatar with his arms tied. 
The old man, whose garb consisted merely of a many-coloured beshmet torn in tatters and ragged drawers, was so feeble that it seemed as if his bony arms, tightly tied behind his misshapen back, were almost falling from his shoulders, and his crooked bare legs moved with difficulty. His face, and even a part of his shaven head, were covered with deep wrinkles. His distorted, toothless mouth, encircled by grey, clipped moustache and beard, incessantly mumbled as though whispering something. But his handsome eyes, from which the lashes were gone, still gleamed with fire, and clearly expressed an old man's indifference to life. Rosencrantz, through an interpreter, asked him why he had not gone with the others. Where should I go? he replied, calmly looking away. Where the rest have gone, suggested someone. The Jiggets have gone to fight with the Russians, and I am an old man. Aren't you afraid of the Russians? What will the Russians do to me? I am an old man he repeated, carelessly glancing at the circle surrounding him. On the way back, I saw this old man without a hat, with his hands still tied, jolting behind a mounted Cossack, and he was looking about him with the same expression of unconcern. He was necessary in an exchange of prisoners. I went to the staircase and crept up to where the captain was. Not many of the enemy, it seems, I said to him, wishing to obtain his opinion about the affair. The enemy, he repeated with surprise. There weren't any at all. Do you call these enemies? Here, when evening comes, you will see how we shall retreat. You will see how they will go with us. Won't they show themselves there? He added, pointing with his pipe to the forest which we had passed in the morning. What is that? I asked, anxiously, interrupting the captain, and drawing his attention to some Don Cossacks who were grouped around someone not far from us. Among them was heard something like the weeping of a child, and the words, Hey, don't cut, hold on, you will be seen. Here's a knife, give him the knife. They are up to some mischief, the brutes, said the captain indifferently. But at this very instant, suddenly from around the corner, came the handsome ensign with burning, horror-stricken face, and waving his hands rushed among the Cossacks. Don't you move, don't kill him! he cried in his boyish treble. When the Cossacks saw the officer, they started back and allowed a little white goat to escape from their hands. The young ensign was wholly taken aback, began to mutter something, and stood before them full of confusion. When he caught sight of the captain and me on the roof, he grew still redder in the face and, springing up the steps, joined us. I thought they were going to kill a child, he said with a timid smile. Ten. The general had gone on ahead with the cavalry. The battalion with which I had come from Fort N remained in the rear guard. The companies under command of Captain Klopov and Lieutenant Rosencrantz were retreating together. The captain's prediction was fully justified. As soon as we had reached the narrow forest of which he had spoken, from both sides the mountaineers, mounted and on foot, began to show themselves incessantly, and so near that I could very distinctly see many crouching down with muskets in their hands and running from tree to tree. The captain took off his hat and piously made the sign of the cross. A few old soldiers did the same. In the forest were heard shouts, the words, Yai, Giao, Urus, Yai! Dry, short musket reports followed in quick succession, and bullets whizzed from both sides. Our men silently replied with rapid fire. Only occasionally in the ranks were heard exclamations in the guise of directions. He has stopped shooting there. He has a good chance behind the trees. We ought to have cannon, and such expressions. The cannon were brought to bear on the range, and after a few discharges of grape, the enemy apparently gave way. But after a little, their fire became more and more violent with each step that the army took, and the shouts and war cries increased. We were scarcely three hundred sergeants from the Aul when the enemy's shot began to hail down upon us. I saw a ball with a thud strike one soldier dead. But why relate details of this terrible spectacle, when I myself would give much to forget it? Lieutenant Rosencrantz was firing his musket without a moment's cessation. With animating voice, he was shouting to the soldiers and galloping at full speed from one end of the line to the other. 
He was slightly pale, and this was decidedly becoming to his martial countenance. The handsome ensign was in his element. His beautiful eyes gleamed with resolution. His mouth was slightly parted with a smile. He was constantly riding up to the captain and asking permission to charge. We'll drive them back, he said impulsively. We'll drive them back, surely. No need of it, replied the captain gently. We must get out of here. The captain's company occupied the edge of the forest and was fully exposed to the enemy's fire. The captain, in his well-worn coat and tattered cap, slackening the reins for his white trotter and clinging by his short stirrups, silently stayed in one place. The soldiers were so well trained and did their work so accurately that there was no need of giving commands to them. Only now and then he raised his voice and shouted to those who exposed their heads. The captain's face was very far from martial, but such truth and simplicity were manifest in it that it impressed me profoundly. There is someone who is truly brave, I said to myself involuntarily. He was almost exactly the same as I had always seen him. The same tranquil motions, the same even voice, the same expression of frankness on his homely but honest face. But by his more than ordinarily keen glance, it was possible to recognize him as a man who infallibly knew his business. It is easy to say the same as always, but how different were the traits brought out in others? One tried to seem calmer, another rougher, a third gayer than usual. But by the captain's face, it was manifest that he did not even understand how to seem. The Frenchman who at Waterloo said, La garde meurt, mais ne se rend pas, and other heroes, especially among the French, who have uttered notable sayings, were brave, and really uttered notable sayings. But between their bravery and the bravery of the captain, is this difference? that if a great saying in regard to any subject came into my hero's mind, I believe that he would not have uttered it, in the first place, because he would have feared that in saying something great he might spoil a great deed, and secondly, because when a man is conscious within himself of the power to do a great deed, there is no need of saying anything at all. This, in my opinion, is the especial and lofty character of Russian bravery. And how, henceforth, can it fail to wound the Russian heart when among our young warriors one hears French platitudes, which have their vogue because they were the stock phrases of the old French nobility? Suddenly, from the direction in which the handsome ensign with his division was stationed, was heard a faint hurrah from the enemy. Turning round at this shouting, I saw thirty soldiers who with muskets in their hands and knapsacks on their shoulders were going at double quick across the ploughed field. They stumbled, but still pushed ahead and shouted. Leading them galloped the young ensign, waving his sabre. All were lost to sight in the forest. At the end of a few moments of shouting and clash of arms, a frightened horse came dashing out of the woods, and just at the edge soldiers were seen bearing the killed and wounded. Among the latter was the young ensign. Two soldiers carried him in their arms. He was pale as a sheet, and his graceful head, where could be now detected only the shadow of that martial enthusiasm which inspired him, but a moment before, was strangely drawn down between his shoulders and rested on his breast. On his white shirt under his coat, which was torn open, could be seen a small blood stain. Ah, what a pity! I said in spite of myself as I turned away from this heart-rending spectacle. Indeed, it's too bad, said an old soldier, who with gloomy face stood beside me, leaning on his musket. He wasn't afraid of anything. How is this possible? He added, looking steadily at the wounded lad. Always foolish, and now he has to pay for it. Eleven. Four soldiers bore the ensign on a litter. Behind them followed a soldier from the suburb, leading a lean, foundered horse laden with two green chests in which were the surgeon's implements. They were expecting the doctor. The officers hurried up to the litter and tried to encourage and comfort the wounded lad. Well, Brother Alanin, it'll be some time before you dance and make merry again, said Lieutenant Rosencrantz, coming up with a smile. He probably intended these words to sustain the handsome ensign's courage. But as could be easily seen from the coldly mournful expression in the eyes of the latter, 
These words did not produce the wished-for effect. The captain also came up. He gazed earnestly at the wounded young fellow, and his always cold, calm face expressed heartfelt pity. How is it, my dear Anatoly Ivanovich? said he, in a tone which rang with a deeper sympathy than I had expected from him. We see it's as God wills. The wounded lad looked up. His pale face was lighted with a mournful smile. Yes, I disobeyed you. Say rather, it was God's will, replied the captain. The doctor, who had now arrived, took from his chest bandages, probes and other instruments, and rolling up his sleeves with a reassuring smile, approached the sufferer. So it seems they have been making a little hole through you, he said, in a tone of jesting unconcern. Let us have a look at the place. The ensign listened, but in the gaze which he fixed on the jolly doctor were expressed surprise and reproachfulness, which the latter did not expect. He began to probe the wound and examine it from all sides, but at last the sufferer, losing his patience, pushed away his hand with a heavy groan. Let me be, he said in an almost inaudible voice. It makes no difference. I am dying. With these words he fell on his back, and five minutes later when I joined the group gathered about him and asked a soldier, How is the ensign? I was told, He has gone. Twelve. It was late when the expedition, deploying in a broad column, entered the fortress with songs. The sun had set behind the snow-covered mountain crest and was throwing its last rosy rays on the long, delicate clouds which stretched across the bright, pellucid western sky. The snow-capped mountains began to clothe themselves in purple mist. Only their upper outlines were marked with extraordinary distinctness against the violet light of the sunset. The clear moon, which had long been up, began to shed its light through the dark blue sky. The green of the grass and of the trees changed to black and grew wet with dew. The dark masses of the army, with gradually increasing tumult, advanced across the field. From different sides were heard the sounds of cymbals, drums, and merry songs. The leader of the sixth company sang out with full strength and full of feeling and power. The clear chest notes of the tenor were borne afar through the translucent evening air.